Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about really it's like part two of what Dennis was talking about this morning on tsunamis and skew bridges. Um, but the focus here is on the effect of debris on the, the loads in a bridge when it is being overtopped in a tsunami. So Dennis is a co-author and Anas Espar, who is sitting over here on my right, your left, is the graduate student on that project. So I'll talk about the objectives, the participants, um, some of the background. This presentation is more questions than answers since we've only just started on it. It's a peer-funded project. The contracts were signed in the summer of this last year, so we've been at this about six months into a two-year project. So the background, the challenges involved, the previous work that we have done in this field, and just some fundamental questions that we're setting out to answer. A bit about the progress to date, to date and experimental test matrix, the debris tracking challenge, and then some acknowledgements. So the objective is uh, broadly to gain insight into debris impact loads on bridges during tsunami overtopping using both numerical and experimental simulation tools. And the numerical tools include mesh-based, particle-based, and hybrid systems, um, which are, um, I would say, commonly used, but widely used by those who do fluid structure interaction and numerical modeling. And we want to adapt these to include debris in the, in the uh, fluid and study debris transport, debris impact, and debris damming using numerical tools and do the same experimentally. And in the experimental world, we will go back and use the large wave flume that's on the Corvallis campus at Oregon State University up in the state of Oregon. And we will use their wave maker to generate tsunami-like waves and bores with them without debris in the, in the water. So, continuing, we'll then explore countermeasures to minimize impact loads. Um, and then I say here develop, maybe I should say refine, prescriptive load equations that include the effect of debris for inclusion in a guideline um, document that's currently being developed and pretty much the first version of it is pretty much done, to be done by PEER uh, for the Ashton Committee on Bridges and Structures. But thinking about well, while we have got this <coughs> topic where we're headed, we want prescriptive equations that designers can use. What's currently used, and we borrow from the building world, uh, um, there, there are at least three approaches, and they all have the issues. The impulse momentum approach, that the debris force is a product of the mass, the velocity <coughs> of impact, and divided by the time it takes to reduce the debris velocity down to zero. The work energy approach, which is mass times velocity squared divided by the stopping distance of the debris. And both of these have problems in not having wide agreement as to what delta T or S should be. And those documents that are around give quite a wide spread for such parameters. Um, and really, they are rigid body impacts. And we should be looking at flexibility issues and the relative stiffness of the debris and the structure that's being struck in developing these equations. And so some, this equation has been floated as, uh, no pun intended, I guess, as one way to look at flexible impact. Um, the participants, I've mentioned Dennis uh, Estrada, a research assistant, Professor Yu and I was a co-PI, uh, Michael Scott at OSU, another co-PI, and Anas, a graduate assistant, uh, doing all the work. So challenging issues with regard to just tsunami inundation or overtopping of bridges. A, it's a multidisciplinary topic, and you would say, well, that's not a challenging issue. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Um, we tend to have different vocabularies and different priorities. And here we have coastal engineers, hydraulic and structural engineers, uh, all needing to work together and understand each other's discipline. And the simulations need to be multi-physics. So the field of fluid structure interaction is in its infancy. Realistic numerical modeling and tsunami overtopping of a bridge structure requires multi-phase flow <coughs> in combination with fluid structure interaction. And what is currently tends to be done is just CFD computational fluid dynamics with rigid bodies representing the, uh, the bridge itself. And the flexibility of the bridge uh, is not in a CFD simulation. 
but CFD simulations run a lot faster than FSI ones. And if we want to do three-dimensional fluid structure interaction, the, the computation of time is intensive. And there's only limited validation on these numerical codes that have been done using data from experiments that are done at a reasonable scale. When it comes to debris impact work, most of it is unsimple, or relatively simple building-like structures. There's nothing currently available uh, for debris impact on bridges. And so the question arises, um, is debris impact damming and inundation process the same in these two types of structures? Or is there a difference between a building and, and a bridge? Continuing the list of challenges, uh, debris transport involves significant uncertainties, uh, which can affect the trajectory of the debris, as well as velocity, orientation of the debris. The velocity, clearly we can see from those um, prescriptive equations, uh, is a key parameter in, uh, in driving or <coughs> controlling or governing the impact force. But then the angle of incidence, the orientation, as the debris strikes the bridge is clearly also an important factor. So there are just two sketches here, or two images here showing on the left, uh, the path of nine containers in a flume, and this will have different trajectories for the same wave. This is the work of, of Nisto in uh, 2017. And on the right, the more debris that you have in the water, um, the less distance it goes, but there's greater scatter, tremendous scatter. In, uh, in distance travel. So a bit of background, uh, some of this was covered this morning on a previous session that at UNR we did, we started on doing single span bridge modeling in the large wave flume at uh, Oregon State in Corvallis. The flume is shown on the upper right, it's 100 meters long, about 3-4 meters wide and 4-5 to five meters deep. Certainly the largest flume I would say in the United States that's in that's not in a military uh, installation. And we explored the role of structural flexibility, air entrapment, air venting, and skew, but clear water experiments only. With extensive instrumentation on the bridge and in the flume, we were able to get total horizontal loads, vertical and horizontal, and the distribution of these forces up to the connections and substructures using load cells under every girder, load cells under the end cap for the vertical and horizontal loads and also a load cell giving us the shears which would go into the substructures but with the superstructure. And the bathymetry, the, the bridge is that black dot uh, here um, with the wave maker down the extreme left hand end. And a, um, the bathymetry is adjusted in the floor of the flume to get the waves to break. Some, so we can have broken and unbroken waves best way to say that, with the instrumentation shown from the flume on the, on the left here. So these are just some photographs of this first round of experiments that we did three, four years ago and repeated and added to them two years ago and we're about to add to them again uh, in uh, later this year. So a single span bridge crossing the width of the flume uh, as you can see in the pictures below. And what we found that in many things, many, many things experimentally, uh, that there are at least four phases in the inundation of a wave over a bridge, from the initial impact phase one to the flooding of the first two chambers in phase two, to the flooding of all three chambers in phase three, and the beginning of overtopping in phase three, and then in phase four, everything is flooded below, and uh, we have overtopping of the bridge itself. So a question then, Going back to more questions. Will the existence of waterborne debris change this mechanism? How much will debris affect the applied forces in the overturning moments? What will be the distribution of this loading to the structural components? Will it be a local effect on just the offshore girder, say with damming effects? Or will the effect be transferred to all the other connections as the inundation progresses? And what happens if debris gets trapped in the chambers below for an open girder bridge, as you might say? we generate another set of uh, quasi steady state damming loads when the debris is trapped underneath the bridge. We know there's a major difference in the uplift forces based on bridge type. Um, you have an open girder bridge with cross frames which are themselves open that run transversely across the width of the bridge but they are like braces and can allow air to 
move down the length of the bridge as, um, of course, the water level rises, and the air that's trapped tries to get out, and one way it can do so is move down the length of the bridge, pass through the cross frames and up through the expansion joints. But if the cross frames are solid beams, and we call them diaphragms, so this might be a concrete bridge with concrete diaphragms, the air can't escape you know, in the same way. Uh, but it's indeed trapped and buoyancy becomes a much more important issue. And then there are box girder bridges, which you know, don't see this one at all, but they're just like big boats um, with, uh, of course, air trapped in the cells, um, but not under any pressure to escape. So box girder bridges are significantly larger uplift forces to the buoyancy than open girder bridges. But on the other hand, open girder bridges could trap the debris. So which type of bridge is more advantageous in a tsunami prone area becomes a good question. And how would debris impact and damming loads change for different bridge types? Wave type is expected to play a significant role in the response. And whenever I come to this topic, I think that in structural dynamics, we stay with viscous damping because it's convenient to do so. Even though we know that in the real world, buildings are not viscously damped, but they're historically damp, but it's convenient to do so because it makes the math easier to, to work with. A single solitary wave is much easier to work with in a firm, it's much more repeatable. And numerically, we have, we have equations for close form equations for single waves, single solitary waves. But as we can see here, uh, <clears throat> so I have the debris, I have a solitary wave, and there's my bridge but the wave has not transported the debris to the bridge. So, the, and, and just repeating this here, um, this time with velocity profiles, you simply see the debris ride, ride, ride over the top of the wave and is not transported to the bridge. So although there are good waves to work with experimentally and numerically, their ability to transport debris is, is limited in, in this sense. Bores, on the other hand, are much more realistic in terms of representing what a tsunami looks like, but they have high variability, or another way to say this, poor repeatability, but due to the chaotic nature of the wave, the plunging type and wave breaking process. So there's three images here on the left of the, the, a wave of the same wave height generated by the same wave maker in the same plume. It's a broken wave, and you can see just on the instant of approaching the bridge deck, so looking straight down, uh, we can see there is a different profile of um, wave reaching the bridge. In the um, from number one, mainly the entire bore front is striking the bridge at the same time. In run number two, maybe the extreme right-hand part of the bore front is just touching the bridge, but the rest of it is yet to catch up. And in run number three, maybe we're getting the ball front just touching the center of the mid part of the bridge. And so we can have wide variability just with the same wave and the same uh, um, bridge type with a ball making sort of repeatability is not, not nowhere near as good. So this can lead to variability in recorded wave heights, spatial distribution of the fluid particles across the width of the flume. And uh, so how is this going to affect debris? if the debris is allowed to take its own path down, down the flume. <coughs> well, how to monitor the wave and the bridge response and track the debris? Wave and bridge response we have experience with. We've done it in the previous uh, experience we've spoken about today with wave gauges and pressure gauges and accelerometers and the, the like, load cells and substructure springs, bearings and bent caps. It's the debris tracking that we see is the greatest challenge that faces us in this experiment. We need to know the velocity at impact and the orientation of the debris at impact. Um, so high-speed cameras have been used and computer vision methods to track fluid velocities and debris motions is being considered. Or we could put sensors within the, each item of debris like a GPS or some form of accelerometer, some form of gyroscope, uh, or some combination of the above. And computer vision has been used for the PIV, particle image uh, 
uh, velocity measurement for tracking debris. So this is one of our experiments from a few years back, looking straight down on the bridge. The wave, in this case, the ball is coming from below, moving up the screen. You see that white water there? And these blue green arrows are velocity vectors. And so we have been able, um, with computer vision techniques, to get the velocity profile across the width of the flume at this instant that we're looking at, the snapshot in time. And we can see in the plot below, velocity is vertical, width of the flume is horizontal on the side of the debris element. And with the green line, we can head into, we calculate the distance down the flume with time. That's x, the vertical rise of the, of the debris item, this is y, and the rotation. And the difference between these two lines, one is from the experiment itself, and the other one is from well, what you've just seen. It's, it was not in the flume experimentally, but it was um, numerical 3D simulations uh, using uh, LSDI and comparing the rigorous uh, solution, numerical simulation, with interpreting the color vision, camera vision, what's happening. <laughs> So where are we in the planning of these experiments? We need to determine the type and scale of the debris objects, whether they be large or small, whether it be just one or many. Um, we need a test matrix, which we will start with the ones used for the clear water studies so we can compare with and without debris. Um, same set of wave heights, wave types, solitary waves and bores. Um, and then sit down and review this wave matrix with the staff at the uh, at the laboratory and OSU. Um, we're going to conduct experiments in the flume at UNR. We have an 80 foot flume at UNR and to work on the debris tracking uh, techniques and decide which indeed is the most suitable. And this is changing dramatically at this instant in time with all kinds of innovations. We need to be able to track this item over large distances in three dimensional space and be waterproof, which is another interesting. There are lots of devices out there for, for tracking X, Y, and Z coordinates of objects. Not so many of them work well when you're in water. Then we need to plan the mobilization to Corvallis, uh, which is about 500 miles north and west of Reno. The, the bridge specimens are in Reno. We built them there, instrumented them. We need to truck them back to Corvallis and the test fixtures the instrumentation, get personnel there, arrange the accommodation, do the safety training, and finally get the experiments done sometime, say, in the spring of, uh, of uh, 2020. Financial support, as I've said, is coming from PIA, but we got going with this with significant support from the Federal Highway Administration and from ODOT, and we could not do this without the technical assistance of the staff at the Wave Lab at Oak Hall Balance, and the staff at my own lab in uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you for that interesting talk. I, mean, I know this experiments in, you know, in the planning stages, but this, uh, you know, somebody have a question or two for um, this. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. I don't. This might be a little naive, but how do you consider the debris like size and um, mass, which I guess are very important design material for this, whether it's going to be a tree or a car or another house, how do you plan on experimenting that and how does that play into the design for these kind of bridges? Well, we have a length scale for this bridge model. Okay. So I can start with the length scale and take a container and divide it by 12. And that'll, that'll give me some dimensions. Now, the weight though is more difficult because. Strictly speaking, with our bridge model, if it's a 1 12th scale, um, we should worry about its mass similitude. And to do that on a shape table, we just add weight. To do that in a flume, you add weight, you add mass, you add um, resistance to flow, and drag forces go up. So we didn't do that. We didn't satisfy the weight similitude in the previous experiments. And I'm not intending to do it again either because we don't want to interfere with, interfere with the flow. So we don't. We're not satisfying all the rules of similitude. So when it comes to weight, we probably won't do that again either. We'll try and get a ratio of weight to the bridge model without similitude masses and the, and the weight of a conventional container out there partially full. So this is one of the exercises that Alice is working on right now. 
is deciding on the debris uh, um, objects. The good thing about a container is we can put instrumentation inside it and uh, get it watertight. So containers are uh, number one, but whether we'll put a tree trunk in the walls. But it's a challenging issue. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me one more question? Yeah. Do you plan to do both box girders and open girders or only open girders? In the previous set, the way we did it, they were open girders, open frames. But for purposes of air, we would bolt into place plywood panels. So for a diaphragm, we would bolt over the face of the cross frame a plywood panel to stop air escaping longitudinally. And for box girder, we would put a plywood panel over the entire bottom courts to keep the air that's trapped and prevent the wave getting up in the chambers. So yes, we intend to do that because we've got all the plywood pieces. It's a matter of we run out of time. Um, these, expense, these experiments are expensive per day, uh, and we just run out of the budget. As to how many of the options we would do. But definitely we see there's a difference between the box girder and the open girder. And even if we don't do the diaphragm case, at least do the open girder, cross frame case, and put the lower plywood. <coughs> sheet in place to simulate the box girder. Quick follow-up, so not uh, following the weight rule and buoyancy being an important step for box girders, would that jeopardize the results? Well, or well we, would still, we would still have the air trapped. We would not allow the wave to get up between the chambers. So this bridge with the <coughs> soffit plywood plate <laughs> sheet would, could be compared with the open frame one, which is the same weight limitations and just see the difference between having a continuous software and an open software. Okay. All right, thank you again.